I sensed a vacuum in, in the nation for some organization that will not pick up guns and go challenge anybody. That's not the old West. We have court systems that should work for the people. And this Supreme Court ruling proved to me, gave me hope, that maybe Congress, even with their low acceptance level, would realize that if they would review their policies of land management in the West, they could stop people dying out here. That's worth asking them to make a little bit of energy so they're not leaving dead people behind, isn't it? These people have to step up and do what they're obligated to do and stop this chaos. So I talked to some very good people and we all got together and I agreed that I would put together a group called CALPO, Coalition of Western Property Owners. That doesn't even say it all. But that's who we are, that's where the crimes are being committed on our properties in the West. And if we don't push back, you're going to sit there and watch us lose our rights, and the day we lose our rights, you have just lost yours. I want to tell you a little about this bear story. I've got three things that happened in my life. In it. I got volumes. Each individual letter certified with the federal government. I was a professional guide and hunter and outfitter. This is 55 years. Me and my mother were the only two outfitters in, in west of Missoula, Montana in 1962. She had been an outfitter since 1938. She also had been the first woman packer to furnish the supplies to the Forest Service, of all people, on the mountain lookout towers. I have newspaper articles of rangers in the past commending this slip of a girl that showed up with the life-sustaining support that these people needed in the towers. They were very proud of her. Something turned 180 degrees, and when she passed away at 81 years old, she had an outfitting business, she was allowed two people for seven days annually to sustain her livelihood. That's how things have changed, evolved, and they've made victims out of people who had earned respect, dignity. They dashed it all and victimized. And I always said in 1984, when the federal government got authority to regulate the outfitting industry, I said, these people haven't got the slightest idea what I do when I'm on that mountain. And I made the mistake of telling one. <laughs> but let me direct you to the back table back there, the Calpo table. And I got a little vein here and wrote the story of Billy Hill, but... <laughs> I didn't know how else, there she's holding one up back there, there's a box of these pamphlets and what I'm going to go through real quick here, there's a box of them there, I hope they last a while, there's some left, help yourself to them, because I document every single thing for 35 years, I'm probably as well documented a combatant as you're ever going to see. I even documented my break time when I wasn't fighting with them. But, 1983, I'm a core driller by trade from years gone by in my youth, and my whole family did that, core drilled for mineral. So in 1983, my mother and I were out getting, I, I was in the business now, I was, her and I were the only two doing it down, that I knew of. Everybody was laughing at us, that, these guys are crazy to even cater them people, babysit them around. Well anyway, we decided to core drill our property, the ranch, which is private property, and the guy that drilled it, he ground the core. If you know what that means, you don't get it out of there to where you can break it up or anything, it all comes out like powder. So he told my mother, well, there was no core when we drilled your ranch, but pay us, pay us our money. 
well, she's getting older, and 83 is the year my father died. Uh, my sister died in a domestic abuse. Uh, my mother adopted her four children. Now, now, now these nephews and nieces are all of a sudden legally my brothers and sisters. And my mother doesn't have a husband, so when the boys are starting to get some size, I got to go out and pull an ear or two, so like a father. So I, you know, I never know from day to day which I am to them, <laughs> except that I told them I'm always the boss. But anyway, getting back to this mineral. So it ended up we didn't get any core. So we went through life looking at each other, saying when the fight started with the Forest Service and they started harassing her about her cattle, she'd say, what did you do to make them mad? And I'd look back and I'd say, it must have been you. I don't know of anything. Well, a year and a half ago, when a friend called me and he said, did you see the new environmental impact statement about that thick for the Rock Creek Mine? And I said, no, I have not. He said, you need to see it. And in this pamphlet back here, they have the whole valley with the Rock Creek Mine ore body, and right in the middle is the Hill Farm, and it's, it's named. It's the only private property named. Green is the outcrop of the Rivet Formation. Yeah, they got the Hill Farm green. X in the legend says copper silver deposit. Yep, X over Hill Farm. You go, you go two pages further, and it says, the ore body contains between 229 million troy ounces of silver and 2 billion pounds of copper. <laughs> Something's starting to ring back to 83 here. It says, because current metal prices are higher than when the 2005 mineral resource estimate was completed, total mineral resources may be greater and metal grades higher than estimated in 2005. I honestly believe my mother died not knowing why she was beat up so bad by the government. And I think somebody wants our place. This is in their document. I have no idea what's under my property, but they do. Something's wrong with this picture. So anyway, get it, we'll move on with, uh, into a, a, cow, a cow. Oh, well, let me go back to the bear deal just a second. So as soon as the trial was over on the bear, my wife and I were talking and I said, I don't think they're capable in carrying it off, but I think we better just start watching for retaliation for us women in this lawsuit. And from that day on, I've got volumes of correspondence and it was just a constant, every single day, letter, demands, uh, threats, going to eliminate my 33-year my, uh, outfit and business. I got elected onto the board of directors of Montana Outfitter Association. I got appointed as chairman of the Forest Service Committee, which probably didn't help my livelihood with my business because it didn't last long after that. And they just uh, told that, they said, you got to have three strikes and you're out. And they, two of them, they just hit me with originally. And they said, I guided two bear hunters in two years illegally. They got no witnesses, not one witness to ever prove that. And when the ranger went over to the Board of Outfitters, the legal arm for outfitting industry, and filed these claims, the attorney for the Board of Outfitters wrote him a letter and said, this, your, your claims have been dismissed. You have no proof. He wrote a letter back and said, I disagree with your findings and I'm finding him unacceptable anyway. There's two of the strikes. The third one, you've got to turn in your your day use, planned use, everything beforehand before you go do it. But there's a stipulation. If somebody comes up to you on Friday night when the Forest Service is all off on vacation for the weekend, and they say, I'll pay you for both days of the weekend, you can go do the use, but then you, as soon as you can, you've got to go in and tell them, I did this, and here's how many days I used. I did that and I asked them to put it on my planned use twice, two different times, 90 days apart in advance. And the day that I went up there, they came and uh, when I was coming out from packing these guys stuff in, the, the Forest Service uh, Sheriff was there, uh, officer was standing in the trail and he, he sighted me. 
And this went, so that, that was what they pulled my outfit in business for, is that one right there. Uh, a congressional delegate just called up the Forest Service and said, so did you, did you ever hear Bill Hill come into the office and request you put that in his planned use? And they said, no, never heard of anything like that. And the congressional delegate said, how did you know where to find him at this time on this day then? <laughs> now talk about the lion, it goes on, folks. Anyway, get it to the, let me, let me hit something really, really important to me. I mean, maybe I'm over-exaggerating. But the cattle business and open range is a controversial issue. I realize it is. My family's run open range in Sanders County for 65 years. Uh, this thing, they, they started threatening my mother, they, and then when she passed away and I inherited the, the ranch, she, uh, they started harassing me, sent me threatening, me threatening letters. And I had this friend in Washington, D.C., a little gal, little, little gal, little page, little lobbyist, whatever she is. And I called her and I said, can you, or how long would it take you to get me an FBI investigation of the Forest Service depriving me of my Montana constitutional right to open range? And she said about five minutes. So a week later, I get a note in the mail, and she said, underway. That's all she said. But the response that we got three weeks later is shocking to me. It doesn't seem to ring a bell with a lot of people, but maybe I'm just paranoid. But what they said in their response was, concerning the Montana Constitution and the, my right to open range, they said, However, state laws do not apply to federal lands due to eminent domain. The Tenth Amendment just died right there. Anyway, uh, this went on for 35 years, folks. My time is up. I wish I had time to tell you the whole story. Uh, I'm, I'm always available for anybody. Shake your hand, I'll tell you a story. You'll get tired of hearing me. <laughs> I just, I just love the people so much for standing by, and we need to put this cowpool organization together and make it a national organization, and to protect all of us, even. Thank you very much. for sheriff for a couple times and wish he would have won but that's another story for another time all right I know you're you're getting uh, we've got two more short speakers and then we're gonna have a break so bear with us our next speaker um, let me see where am I oh I I am so excited this man is a gentle giant um, I respect this man this man knows what courage is, and I am so honored to introduce the ex-fire chief from Burns, Oregon, Chris Bryles. That's how you do that. Thanks a woman. <laughs> that was kind of fun, wasn't it? <laughs> My name is Chris Bryles. I uh, moved to Burns, Oregon in 1978. Uh, you been there? 
It's a good little place. It's got a lot of beautiful people there. It's got a lot of wonderful country. A lot of resources that you just wouldn't realize driving through town. Uh, I grew up on a ranch in Colorado and I always learned that you help your fellow man. And you live your life right. You know, there's a difference between right and wrong. And if it's wrong, you don't do it. And if it's right, you stand up for it. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy to figure out. It should be. Uh, I was asked to come and, and, and talk and I readily agreed I would drive. Uh, my, my friend Todd Applegate drove me up here. And I want to talk to you about what I saw in Burns, Oregon. Uh, how many people here saw what happened to the Bundys in Nevada. Did it ever occur to you as it did to me? When I watched that, I thought, uh-oh, there's a bunch of radicals and the government's going to get rid of them. No. But that's because I, that was the information that I was getting on my TV. Yeah, right. And what didn't work out quite right for me, didn't ring quite true, is all of a sudden... The BLM, after rounding up their cattle and killing them and doing all kinds of stuff, the BLM left. And I thought, huh, how is that? Not knowing the true facts, not knowing the actual things that happened, the BLM left. To me, that meant the BLM was in the wrong and they knew it and they left but I didn't know anything about Ammon Bundy I didn't know anything about Cliven and all of a sudden they said well Ammon Bundy is coming to Harney County and he's going to be talking because of what the atrocities that had happened to Dwight and Stephen Hammond in Burns in Harney County here, they get, here these guys are, they get five years for setting a backfire to protect their own property that burned less than 150 acres of sagebrush. What is the best thing you can do for sagebrush? <laughs> yeah, burn it and, and it'll come back in grass. So they didn't harm the property. They saved their ranch, they were sentenced to a mandatory minimum of five years. Wow. Well, they got, and the, the judge says it would shock the conscience to impose these fines on these men for this type of an infraction. So they got far less sentences. They went and they served them. They got out of prison, and they and the government says, no, wait a minute, they forgot to to serve the mandatory minimum, you have to go back. And they sent him back. So Ammon Bundin, he shows up with his people. And I'm going, what is going on in my backyard now? I got to go find out about this, you know. I'm not going to listen to anybody else. I'm kind of a bullheaded old turd that makes up my own mind. And I grew up on the premises that when you meet someone, you give him a good firm handshake and you look him right square in the eye. That's how you greet someone. And if you've ever done that, if you've lived your life that way, you suddenly realize that you can judge character fairly quickly that way. I went to the fairgrounds to find out what was going on. And I had chips on my shoulder. I thought, now you know, I'm not going to have somebody coming in and causing a problem in my county. I shook Ammon Bundy's hand and I looked him in the eye and I immediately knew this is a real person. This isn't some phony person. This is a person that's concerned and honest and caring and loving. I mean, you can tell it right away. So I sat there in that meeting 
and, and they, they gave us some training on the Constitution of the United States of America. Wow. Like what Ryan was talking about before. They gave us some training. They gave us the history and the history of the committees of safety and, and how valuable they were and what they were for. What the committee of safeties were for is to keep the government in line. There's a thing called redress of grievances. Ammon said, hey, let's, let's take another look at what the, has happened to the, to the Hammonds. That's a redress of grievance. Let's look at this. Let's see. Was it conducted correctly? Was it done right? Let's do a grand jury, figure it out. And if it wasn't done right, let's fix it. You know, it's pretty easy to sit back and say, well, do we have a problem? Okay, yeah, we do. Okay, what's it going to take to fix it? That's all there was. So he, he talked about the committees of safety, and we had about 60 people there, and they said, do you think we should have a committee of safety? And it was unanimous. All the hands went up. And I'm sitting there, and uh, they said, well, let's open it for nominations. And so they nominated the first person, and I thought, boy, that poor guy, he just, <laughs> look what just happened to him. I was the second one. <laughs> Later on, the, the, the first man that, that was nominated, he bailed out. He didn't want any repercussions. Uh, he didn't stand up on his own time, hind feet and, and speak out for what he believed because he's worried about some other issues. I thought, okay, I barely know what the Committee of Safety is, but I know that there's a responsibility here. And I have helped the people in my county since the day I moved there, and I wanted to be a public servant still. I had retired in 2006 as the Burns Fire Chief because of the five fusions that I've had to my back and some problems that I encountered while running the ambulance service. I was still a Harney County Fire Chief and looked at as a public figurehead. I'm fairly well known as brutally honest. If you ask me a question, I will give you the answer and it's going to be true. If you don't like the truth, don't ask me a question. <laughs> we had the Committee of Safety. We did a rally. We went up to the Hammonds. We sang songs to them. We gave them flowers. And we got back and Ammon went out and took over the refuge. They say that it was an armed takeover, you know, and all of that. There was nobody at the refuge. They went out there. They had weapons. So, it's a first, you know, it's part of your constitutional right. They didn't hurt anybody. They didn't threaten anybody. They didn't do anything other than go out and take over the refuge. And I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why did they do that? Because I didn't know. I just simply didn't know. I didn't understand what I do now. That's why I stand before you now, is the more people that understand what's going on and what your rights are, the more important that is. So they take over the refuge, and I and and immediately everybody in town says, "Oh my God, that committee of safety! They did, look what they just did." We didn't have any knowledge of it. We didn't know what was going on. So I I went out to the refuge, and what did I see when I got to the refuge? You've all seen the the news media and the the nine million dollars of damage that they did to the refuge and all of that. I went out there. Yeah, an armed standoff. Okay, an armed standoff. They say there was an armed standoff in Arne County. And there was. There was an armed standoff at our courthouse. And at our junior high, there was no armed standoff at the refuge. 
When I went out there, I told him who I was. There was a pickup parked across the way, but I talked to him and I said, hey. And they said, yeah, go on down. So I walked down. I didn't have somebody holding me on both arms or anything like that. I walked down there and what did I see? I saw a great big blue dumpster there. And there were people hauling trash to that dumpster. That's what these horrible people were doing, is cleaning up that cesspool that they had encountered. It hadn't been maintained. It hadn't been taken care of. There were dead rats in the, in the shed and, and just mess everywhere. They were cleaning it up. I saw a guy replacing a light. I saw people working as a team. And it's like, wow, that's cool. Somebody cares about this place. I visited it several times before, and I always thought, wow, can't somebody clean the flies out of the windows? Can't somebody sweep the floor? Now they claim that they did all this damage to the refuge. Well, I'm here to tell you, they didn't do any damage to the refuge at all. All they did is enhance it, made it better. When all of this happened, they put chain link fences around our courthouse and our sheriff's department and the junior high. Chain link fences and concrete barriers because of the danger. There were all kinds of rumors about these horrible patriots that were coming in and they're going to cause, start causing all kinds of trouble. And the patriots had showed up. You want to know what horrible things they did? We had a rip roar and snowstorm and these nasty patriots were out there shoveling out fire hydrants and handicap parking. That's what kind of horrible people they were. They were so horrible that they actually took coffee and sandwiches to the people that were guarding the courthouse and our airport with automatic weapons. That's what kind of bad people they were. Well, okay. They shut down the schools. They shut down the BLM. They shut down the Forest Service. <clears throat> They gave all the employees the gag order that you cannot go to any of these meetings. You can't talk about this. You can't do anything. I'm here to tell you that I was out at the refuge lots of times. And I felt like my city that I lived in was way more dangerous than the refuge. Way more. Way more threat there. We had MREPs running up and down the street. We had Black Hawk helicopters at the airport. We had great big generators and lights that stood up in the air and they just made the whole place light up. People couldn't sleep up by the courthouse because all the noise and all the lights. There wasn't a gun at the refuge that could reach 30 miles. Not a single gun out there could have reached Burns. But everybody was supposedly in this great fear from these horrible people there. That were going around and teaching the Constitution. That were teaching about our rights. Where was the fear coming from? It was generated by the government and by the FBI. Were we protected by our sheriff's department? No. No. Was our sheriff out there looking after our best interests? No. He was doing exactly what he was told by the FBI. That's a sad thing. We had blacked out windows, black SUVs wandering around town and everybody said, well, that's the Patriots. You got to watch out. You know, they're creepy people. I went to a friend of mine's house and he told me, you've aligned yourself with the wrong people. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, at the, over here at the armory this morning, he said, some of your Patriot friends were over there. 
and he said we had to call the cops on him. And he got a call on the phone, and he says they're over there again. And he poked me in the chest, and he said, "You go find out what your cohorts are doing." And I said, "I don't have any cohorts, but I ain't afraid of any man on this earth. I'll go find out." So I went over there, and at the refuge, here was two white vehicles on a black SUV. And they, as soon as I got there, they took off. Well, the two cars went one way, and the black one went the other way. And that was at the armory. That was at the armory in Burns. And so I followed that vehicle. I didn't have my lights on or nothing. I just followed them, and, and they realized I was following them, and I wasn't going to go anywhere. And when we got to McDonald's, they went drove around the parking lot for a while and they stopped. And I got out and I went and I said, hey, my name's Chris Briles and I've been here a long time and there's a lot of weird things going on in our community and I just had a friend of 25 years say that you guys are my cohorts so I'd like to know who you are <laughs> and, and, and what you're doing. And they said, well, we're just a couple of guys going through town looking for a place to start a new business. And I said, well, typically we don't start a new business in our armory. <laughs> and he said, well, we weren't at the armory. And I said, yeah, you were. I just followed you from there. And they said, well, you have no right to follow us. And I said, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And I said, I just want to alleviate the fears in our community. You know, if you weren't doing anything, I just want to know the truth so that I can talk to my people. I don't like to see people be afraid. And they said, we're, we're just a couple of guys starting a business, like we said. And then the, the smaller of the two, they were, weren't dressed in Patriot outfits or nothing like that. They were just dressed in ordinary clothes. One guy had a shirt that looked like he'd been painting in it, and they had ripstop uh, pants on like, like Nomex pants. And uh, the smaller one said, well, yeah, we were at the armory. Okay, and what were you doing there? Well, we were just looking at the deer in the backyard. There was a four-point back there that's a pretty good shooter. And I said, well, typically we don't shoot the deer in the yard at the armory. <laughs> and I sense that you're not being honest with us. Would you, would, you, would you please be honest with me? I said, well, we just want to get something to eat. That's all we want to do. And I said, I will buy your meal if you're just honest with me. Tell me the truth. That's all I'm asking. They wouldn't give me their full names. They just said they wanted to eat. So they did. They went into McDonald's. I took a picture of their license plate. I have it on my phone still. And I went to go up to the courthouse to find out what was going on. Bear in mind that I've lived there since 1978. There's not a person in Harney County that doesn't know who I am. And I walked up there to the concrete barricades and guards with automatic weapons in full tactical gear. And I went up there, I parked my rig, and I thought, well, I'm gonna go over there. The guy met me with a rifle, says, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I need to go talk to Dave Ward. Something's not right. He said, no, he's in meetings. He can't talk to you. And I said, well, you, can you tell him Chris Bryles is out here and I wanna talk to him? He said, if you have a problem, you call 911. And I said, I'm not going to abuse the system like that. I said, but I do want to talk to somebody about some suspicious activity. And he said, just call 911. I said, well, thanks for nothing. You know? And so I went back down to the armory, and there, were, uh, there was a sheriff's deputy and the Burns police chief there. And they said, what's going on? And I told them. I said, these guys were dishonest. They were lying to me. And I don't understand it. While I was talking to him, the sheriff's deputy got a phone call. And he says, oh, okay. And I said, what's going on? He said, the two white vehicles are FBI vehicles. And the black SUV is a rental out of Washington State. And that's undercover FBI people. And that is to be kept a secret. Don't tell anyone. Does that sound right? You know, if you look at something, it's either right or wrong. That didn't feel right to me. 
So I was stewing about that, and our Harney County judge had his Harney County meeting at our high school. The bleachers were full of people. There were probably three times as many people that are here. He was out there strutting around on the, on the basketball court, and he said, hey, uh, first the thing, he got the microphone, he said, I want you to know that there's a Harney County Committee of Safety, and they're in no way, shape, or form affiliated with Harney County. Now, they've got a website, and they've got our county logo on there without our permission. And I want you to know to, to don't give any credibility to these people, you know. And this is in front of all these people. And so the microphone got there. My time's up, but I'm going to finish this a little bit. Uh, when the microphone got there, I had kept it a secret about the FBI until I had the microphone in my face in front of national TV. <laughs> and then I let them know. And the next day I had a big argument with Mr. Stephen Grasty, and then I resigned as the fire chief because of the corruptness. And they tried to bait me into doing something wrong. And I will not work for dishonest government. Will not. What I want to close in, I received gobs and gobs and gobs of friend requests for Facebook. We have no, we have no radio station, no TV station in, in Burns. We do now, but it's not real well. Anyway, there were lots of people that said, hey, you are a hero. You are an American hero. You are. And that, yeah, but listen, it broke my heart to be considered a hero. I have two arms. I have two legs. Why should you be considered a hero? Because you stand up and speak the truth. Yeah. This is the United States of America. This is where we should all be able to stand up and speak the truth. Just look at me. I'm an old man. I'm not a hero. This room is full of people that can be heroes. All you have to do is stand up and speak the truth. Thank you. this last year um, and I had to tell her that I still have a hard time trusting politicians and uh, that's that's gonna be a hard one to get over but she's she's gaining she's gaining good she's awesome. and, uh, so welcome Senator Filler Just a word of advice, never trust a politician. <laughs> but, um, I don't consider myself a politician, but an elected representative of the people of Sanders County and Mineral County and part of Flathead County and part of Missoula County. I'm one of you. 
and it's my privilege to have been elected by you and to go stand up in, room, in rooms full of politicians <laughs> and speak the truth and to try to help them to understand more about what's going on for those that don't get it. There are some good ones in the Montana legislature, let me tell you. Representative Teresa Manzella is here. Would you stand up, Teresa? <laughs> She's a horsewoman and she doesn't take no bull. <laughs> so, in, in the legislative process, you do become somewhat transformed. I'm a regular person, but I have a higher responsibility because um, I'm held to a higher standard when I do speak. And I take that seriously. So, <clears throat> I'm not quick to jump on bandwagons. I do my homework, do a lot of homework. And I appreciate the people that provide me with information and concerns and bring concerns to my attention, like the Ryan family has. Um, so I started doing some homework on what caused the uprising in Burns, Oregon. Why, why did the, the Bundys and all these other people go there and occupy that bird refuge, at, risk their lives to do it? And so I started to lay out the facts of the Hammond case by reviewing the court records, the jury verdicts, the government records. I interviewed um, both of the Hammond wives, Stephen's wife and, and uh, Dwight's wife. And uh, here's what I found. And these are facts that I'm laying out into a resolution that will go before the President of the United States and the U.S. Congress. So, I don't normally read in front of an audience, but it's very factual and I want to make sure that I'm clear on that, so I'm going to read it. In the state of Oregon, federal agencies sentenced ranch rancher Dwight Hammond, now 78, and his son Stephen Hammond, now 49, to five years in federal prison for the crime of utilizing common range management fires that spread slightly off of their own land and onto a small portion of adjacent public land, each causing less than $1,000 in damage. The charges and penalties levied against the Hammonds were extraordinarily severe, especially in light of the fact that federal land managers have, on numerous occasions, accidentally and purposely at times, burned thousands of acres of public land and private land, including homes, without consequence to the agency or its employees, and without compensation to the landowners whose property they destroyed. At the criminal trial of the Hammonds, the federal government's own witness actually testified that the fire that Dwight and Stephen were both found guilty of igniting actually improved the range, and that the Bureau of Land Management committed no suppression resources to the fire. In other words, they didn't spend any money on that fire, and the fire improved the range. Curiously, the charges against, against Dwight and Stephen Hammond were preceded by a long period in which the Hammonds had been publicly critical of federal land managers' actions. For decades, the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had deployed federal administrative powers to punitively regulate and prosecute the Hammond family in what now appear to be efforts to take over the Hammonds Ranch and water rights. For 20 years, the Hammonds warded off federal land managers' attempts to block them from trailing their cattle on lawfully held, to their lawfully held grazing lands via historic stock driveways that were verified in historical records. 
1994, the BLM and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service falsely arrested Dwight Hammond for, protre for protecting the Hammond's family, uh, their legally owned water rights, and the Hammond's subsequently prevailed in state court by proving their vested water right claims. Between 1994 and 2006, even though the Hammonds held federal grazing permits that were attached to their statutorily protected grazing preference and their vested stock water rights, federal land managers stripped them of three BLM grazing permits and one Malheur National Wildlife Refuge grazing permit, thereby systematically gutting the economic viability of the Hammond Ranch. In 2001, after receiving BLM permission, Dwight and Stephen Hammond started a prescribed range management burn on their private land that accidentally spilled over to about 137 acres of adjoining public land, land upon which the Hammonds held the grazing rights and managed. However, Stephen reported, he reported that the fire had spread beyond his own property boundary. The government expert testified that the fire improved the range, and the, at the time the BLM didn't cite him for it. It wasn't for nine years until they decided to cite him for it. Wow. So that was the 2001 fire. In 2006, during a violent thunderstorm, lightning ignited a wildfire that seriously threatened to wipe out the Hammonds' winter feeding grounds. And in a widely accepted firefighting practice, the Hammonds started a strategic emergency backfire on their private land, which successfully saved their winter grazing areas, protected their home and barns, and potentially saved thousands of acres of public land from being engulfed in the wind-driven flames. The 2006 backburn slightly encroached onto the adjacent public land an estimated one acre. The jury concluding it cost less than a thousand dollars in damage. The Bureau of Land Management pursued criminal charges for the 2006 fire for the backburn in state court but the district attorney reviewed the facts and declined to press charges. So that was 2006. And then, in 2010, just before the statute of limitations ran out on that 2001 fire, the one that improved the range, the BLM brought the Hammonds into federal court, indicting them on numerous charges relating to both fires. The BLM avoided bringing charges under their own statutes, which specifically provide an exception for crimes related to fires started by ranchers who own grazing allotments in certain circumstances. 18 U.S.C. subsection 1855 says, this section shall not apply in the case of a fire set by an allottee in the reasonable exercise of his property rights on the allotment. So they didn't use that statute because it wouldn't result in a... Uh, a mandatory prison sentence. Normally, the BLM would cite a rancher with a trespass burn under its own statutes. That's the applicable, applicable citation. But instead of that, federal prosecutors charged Dwight and Stephen Hammond as arsonists under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. This is the law that was, in enact, was enacted in response to Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. They applied that law to these two ranchers. Eventually, all of the federal government's claims about the ranchers lighting fires on, on public lands and endangering federal employees and attempting to destroy government vehicles were proven unfounded. The jury said, not guilty. Ten of the 13 
most egregious charges against the Hammonds were either dismissed or concluded in the jury's not guilty verdict. The one count that Dwight was found guilty of related solely to the 2001 prescribed burn which was ignited on the Hammonds' private land after his son Stephen had called the BLM dispatcher asking, quote, if it was okay to burn private land in the Steens Mountain area that day. And the BLM dispatcher on duty told Stephen at that time, quote, it was okay that there were no burning restrictions anymore, unquote. This from the, this from the trial records. Whereas in the end, the Hammonds were only found to have been involved in two range management fires, fires that they had started on their own land and conducted in accordance with standard techniques that are common among ranchers, farmers, and public land managers in the area. The federal district court judge that heard the case declared, quote, it would be cruel and unusual punishment for this crime to give them the mandatory minimum of five years, unquote, as required under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. In fact, the judge issued a sentence of one year for Stephen and 90 days for Dwight, and he even allowed the men to serve staggered terms so they could continue to keep the family ranch afloat. But, after finally succeeding in a conviction against the Hammonds, albeit minuscule, the federal government filed an outrageous claim for damages in the amount of $1.3 million in a civil suit. And then they offered, in what many would say, and I would agree, amounts to extortion, to drop all charges on the condition that the Hammonds sign over two-thirds of their ranch to the federal government. Wow. <laughs> Facing perhaps the largest and most well-funded law firm in the world, the United States government, and under extreme duress, the Hammonds agreed to a plea that would lower the fine from $1.3 million to $400,000 and require that they give the BLM the first right of refusal to purchase their ranch if for some strange reason they were ever required to sell it. The Hammonds paid the fine and they served out the sentences that the judge had handed down of one year for Stephen and 90 days for Dwight. But then the federal government pressed forward with another criminal on more criminal charges, or on the same criminal charges, but to an appeal for resentencing, asking for the full force of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act to be applied to these men in a relentless effort to lock Dwight and Stephen up for a full five years. The very sentence the federal district court judge had declined to apply, saying such a harsh punishment under the circumstances, quote, would shock the conscience, unquote. And that's what happened. People's consciences were shocked. In what many in the West and across the nation view it as a manifest miscarriage of justice, very much akin to double jeopardy, Dwight and Stephen Hammond were indeed resentenced to five years in federal prison, and they were required to serve their sentences at the same time, making it impossible for them to help keep the family ranch going they remain incarcerated to this day. Although the Hammonds went away quietly and declined to protest, declined to publicly criticize under threat, they didn't participate with the march and the, the protest, the march that happened in Burns, Oregon, nor did they condone the takeover of the wildlife refuge. But numerous Americans knew something was very, very wrong, and they risked their lives in a symbolic occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge to bring a national spotlight to the plight of the Hammonds and to request a peaceful redress of many other grievances concerning the federal government's 
heavy-handed control of half of all lands in Western America. Now, in a separate but related case, which you'll hear a lot more about from other folks, and I won't get into too many details today, but in the state of Nevada, a case of conflict between the BLM and Nevada rancher Ivan Bundy had culminated in a tense standoff between BLM law enforcement agents and hundreds of conscientious Americans who had come to Bundy's aid. The federal government pressed charges against Bundy, his sons, and supporters for their role in this Nevada standoff, as well as charges against Ammon and Ryan Bundy and others that participated in the Malher occupation. And then, it didn't look like they had much chance. And they did a lot of work on their own. I'm going off script here a little bit. Did you know Ryan represented himself in court? Yeah. And how many counts? Five in Oregon, 16 or 17 in Nevada. <laughs> and he won every one of them. Shauna Cox, who you'll hear from a little bit later after the break, represented herself as well. And she won. But I know they'll tell you they didn't do it alone. Okay, so um, I don't want anyone to leave here today thinking that all people in the federal government are bad because there's a lot of good ones in there. We need to remember that. There's good people with families and they care about this country. They love this country just like we do. So don't go away from here with a stereotype about government or even politicians. Hopefully I break that mold for you on the politician part. In a 17-page whistleblowing letter released by Bureau of Land Management Special Agent Larry Wooten, who was the lead investigator in the Nevada standoff, he cited multiple cover-ups within federal agencies and, quote, a widespread pattern of bad judgment, lack of discipline, incredible bias, unprofessionalism,